game theory. What does that make you think of? If you've had any exposure to the subject, you might know of The Prisoner's Dilemma. It's a game that has captured the imagination of philosophers, evolutionary biologists, and of course economists. The TLDR takeaway from The Prisoner's Dilemma is always this. Screw your friends. Look out for number one. Selfishness is king, and cooperation is for chumps. But is that all there is to it? Does the game really tell you to screw over your friends? Let's try and pick this apart. Let's skip the little fairy tale that you probably have heard about the prisoner's dilemma with hardened criminals facing intense questioning. And let's just focus on the essentials. The key ingredient, aside from the fact that there are two players and two actions they can choose from to cooperate or defect, is the payoff structure. In order to start thinking about what outcome to expect from the game, we really need to be able to say how the person ranks the various outcomes of the game. Once we know how they rank things, we can then build some more mathematical machines to solve the game. So the key is knowing someone's preferences. The prisoner's dilemma is so heavily rigged that we won't even need to talk about any of the fancy math stuff to understand the outcome. Let's just focus on the preferences for the type of player that is engaged in the prisoner's dilemma game. All right, let's think about a single player and let's rank actions for this person when they face different actions from their opponents. Let's call our player Alice. We want to know what Alice would do when faced with different actions from her opponent. Alice can pick between defecting and cooperating. Let's bring in our fairy tale again. Let's add some color. Alice is a hardened criminal. She trusts no one and has no friends. She must now decide whether to defect or cooperate if her co opponent cooperates. Well, Alice is a tough gangster, so she will pick defect. She trusts no one, remember? Now assume her opponent wants to defect. Aha, she is right to be so cynical. There are defectors in the world. So she will defect in the face of defection. In other words, Alice ranks defecting over cooperating, regardless of what her opponent does. Now imagine that she plays this game with someone who is exactly like her, another hardened criminal who ranks actions in exactly the same way. In other words, defect if you see a cooperator, and defect if you see a defector. It doesn't take much to now understand why defecting becomes everyone's favorite action. And it should be no surprise that they both defect. When we think about the setup of the game in this way, there is no surprise that no cooperation occurs. It can't. By definition, we have created a character that always prefers to defect, regardless of her opponent's actions. And if we put two people like that into a room, well, they're going to defect. The game is not meant to help you decide what to do. It's there to demonstrate what happens when two people who are absolutely awful play the game. Beyond that, it has little value. It's a tautology. If two terrible people play a game, they will pick terrible outcomes. So the question is, why do we keep talking about the prisoner's dilemma? How many situations do we want to analyze people that do not want to cooperate with each other? If you look at the world around you, despite the fact that we disagree with each other about many things, a lot of things occur because we do cooperate. Therefore, the prisoner's dilemma cannot describe every specific phenomenon that we face in the world. For that reason, we will talk about different types of games and spend a little bit more time thinking about those in other videos. For now, let's not talk about the prisoner's dilemma again.